Tutbury Castle, a fortress that has stood for almost a thousand years and has witnessed some of the most significant events in English history. Vikings, kings, queens, soldiers, all have passed through its gates, leaving behind a legacy of bloodshed, torture, and betrayal. The castle's walls have been witness to countless battles, and its halls have echoed with the cries of prisoners, both innocent and guilty. This is a story of conflict and struggle, but it is also a story of beauty and culture. Through the stories of its inhabitants, the true power of this fortress can be uncovered. Witness the lives of soldiers, monarchs, and prisoners, all of whom have played a part in the castle's fascinating history. This journey through time will explore the rise and fall of kings and queens, the brutality of war, and the darkness of imprisonment. Discover the power struggles that defined the castle's past and gain insight into the incredible resilience of the people who lived within its walls. This is Forged in Blood, Totbury Castle. Tutbury Castle is a fortress that has stood witness to centuries of bloodshed, betrayal, and intrigue. This ancient stronghold, located on a hilltop in Stratfordshire, England, has a rich and captivating history that spans over a thousand years. Throughout its history, Tutbury Castle has been a symbol of power, wealth, and influence it has seen the rise and fall of monarchs and the brutality of war. It has also been a place of refuge for those who have fallen out of favor with the ruling powers, a place where political prisoners were held and sometimes executed. It is a place where the past and present meet, where the stories of those who lived and died within its walls continue to linger at the castle still. In exploring the history of Tutbury Castle, we are drawn into a world of medieval battles and political intrigue, where the fate of nations hangs in the balance. It is a world of chivalry and courage, but also of violence and betrayal. The ruins of the wall we see today might seem quiet and lonely, but centuries ago, this used to be a place full of life and filled with the animated sounds of people living closely together, trotting on cobbled streets, dogs barking, and kids running around. Now, all the history ingrained in the stone that remains. Tutbury Castle's history begins in 1066, when William the Conqueror, the first Norman King of England, ordered the construction of a wooden fortress on this site. The castle was strategically located to protect the nearby town of Burton upon Trent and the River Dove crossing, which was a vital trade route. Over the next century, the castle was expanded and transformed into a formidable fortress made of stone. In the year 1071, England was a land of contrasts and contradictions. On the one hand, it was a nation that was still struggling to recover from the Norman conquest of 1066, with many parts of the country still in turmoil and many people still struggling to come to terms with the new order. At the same time, however, England was a country that was undergoing a period of intense change and development. 
The Normans were busy building castles and fortifications across the country, while also introducing new ideas, customs, and institutions that would shape English society for centuries to come. The castle was dismantled in 1175 following a siege. The only building that remains from the 12th century is the chapel. The rest of the castle seen today dates from the 14th and 15th centuries, when parts of it were being rebuilt. The outer part is the only one that remains of what used to consist of the south tower and a staircase, as well as two chambers and the high tower. In the 12th century, Tutbury Castle became a favorite of several English monarchs, including King John and Queen Elizabeth I. The castle was a symbol of the monarch's power and grandeur. During this time, the castle's defenses were further strengthened, and the castle became a significant military stronghold. Elizabeth was a highly intelligent young woman. She was gifted in education. Indeed, she spoke eight different languages. Elizabeth was incredibly intelligent, and she spent most of her days as a teenager and young woman at her desk. I mean, it was actually later remarked of her that she would read Greek for fun, um, because that was seen as quite strange. <laughs> Elizabeth also learnt, I think, a great deal through her childhood and adolescence about the politics at court. She learned how to bend, she learned how to stand her ground too. Really was a gifted individual. When it comes to Elizabeth of England, Elizabeth I, I think it's important to try to get as much of a grip on the personality as you can, because it just makes her live a bit more, really, in many ways, and not just be these dusty words in a, in a book. There were some elements of her that were terrifying. She had a, a terrible temper. She swore like a trooper, like a father. In fact, they said she swore like a sailor, I think. But then again, they were quite often linked with blasphemy, like God's breath and this sort of thing. And she's one of Shakespeare's very famous uh, swearings, which was, you four-inch bed presser. Now, I don't know if Elizabeth said that, but that's the kind of thing that was said there. They tend to be a bit more flowery uh, than we say now. But she had a vile temper, and she was under extreme tension. But those chambers you see today weren't always very accommodating to their visitors. The Tudor period was a time of great change in English history. During this time, the English monarchs were at the height of their power, and the country was expanding its influence across the world. However, it was also a time of great political and religious instability, with frequent clashes between Catholics and Protestants. As the 16th century drew to a close, Tutbury Castle remained a strategic stronghold in the heart of England. In the 1580s, the castle played host to one of the most notorious figures of the age, Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary was the granddaughter of Margaret Tudor, sister of Henry VIII, and had a strong claim to the English throne. However, her Catholic faith and her tumultuous personal life had made her a threat to the Protestant Queen Elizabeth I, who had Mary imprisoned in a number of different castles around the country. Her time at Tutbury was marked by isolation, boredom, and frustration. A very large number of people are aware that Mary Queen of Scots was a prisoner here and are very interested in that. Of course, she was a tremendous, glamorous, tragic figure in, in our history. Mary, Queen of Scots, is undoubtedly Elizabeth's rival. They are two parallel queens, two queens in one aisle. 
Mary was born in 1542, and when she was six days old, she became reigning Queen of Scotland. She's the Queen of Scots from birth, almost. She had a very troubled upbringing before being sent to France, where she was engaged to the French Dauphin, the heir to the French throne. She becomes Queen of France very briefly, but then when her husband dies, she returns to Scotland as an independent ruler. Elizabeth had perhaps been astute when imprisoning her cousin Mary, for indeed Mary did conspire to overthrow Elizabeth and to place herself on the English throne. And indeed that the castle was owned by Elizabeth I going, and in fact going right the way back to 1199, the castle had been owned uh, by the monarch, and still is, I should say. But what's so interesting about the Mary Queen Scots and Elizabeth idea is Elizabeth was actually due to visit uh, here uh, in 1571, but Mary had already been, so she sort of called off, I don't think I want to breathe the same air. Mary was prisoner here for the very first time on the 2nd of February 1569. Before that time, having escaped from Scotland, uh, Mary Stuart had been in Carlisle, where she crossed over, you know, in a boat and was there for a while. Then she travelled down to England, and all that time she was under housekeep. Uh, do you like politicians? It's a euphemism for, well, we're just going to see if we can get away with this because Elizabeth was taking the pulse of every royal house of Europe with her ambassadors, and the quotes were, we have the Scotch Queen. Do you want her? But apparently not. So when Mary came here on the 2nd of February, 1569, she was told, and this castle was absolutely vast and full of streets and crowded and horses moving around, all these things going on. She was told she was now a prisoner. And of course, she was being questioned about the death of her second husband, Darnley, who was a really horrible man, actually. That doesn't mean he's entitled to be murdered or entitled to murder him, rather. But what it does mean is that uh, she had some answering to do because he was very, very close to the English throne in the succession. And he was, no doubt about it, murdered. Many people believe she was colluded with her third husband, Bothwell. So when she came here, she had two dead husbands, second murdered, first husband, Francois, France, the Dauphin, died young, at 17 years of age. After she realised she couldn't stay in Scotland any longer, Mary fled to England. And it was the absolute worst decision she could have taken because Elizabeth was the one person who could never allow Mary to have her freedom because Mary is such a threat to her rule. When Elizabeth hears that Mary has landed in the north of England, she orders that she be placed under house arrest. And Mary remains imprisoned by Elizabeth for 20 years. The two women never meet. Mary is desperate to come to court to plead her case with Elizabeth, but Elizabeth will not see her. Instead, Mary slowly begins to lose hope and she starts plotting against Elizabeth. And there are several plots, at least, that her name is mentioned in or that she seems to have had direct involvement in. Lastly, of course, she is involved in the Babington plot where she gives her consent to murder Elizabeth. And in many respects, this is a really sensible policy for Mary because actually, were Elizabeth to die at any point during Mary's imprisonment, it's really likely that Mary would be declared Queen of England. She knows that there's just one heartbeat between her and the English succession. So when she arrived here, there were these murders and death associated with her. And on top of that, she'd been locked up in Scotland. She'd escaped, there'd been the Battle um, of Langside, and she had escaped into England. Her third husband by then was going mad in a jail in Denmark. He was chained to a concrete post going round and round like a dog. And uh, he was extremely attractive and a cousin. And in there lies a lot of the problem. So there's that, she'd left behind her son, James, who she'd signed over to for the regency of her bastard half-brother, Murray. Uh, he'd been after it for a long time. And she'd lost her son, her kingdom, and her dignity. 
because at this point she is being shown on leaflets as a crowned mermaid, which is a prostitute. And the running hair at the bottom, which is the symbol of Bothwell. It must have been absolutely terrifying for her to come here and be told this. In fact, it was so terrifying that she vomited black blood, sign of an ulcer, collapsed across the neck of the horse, was held down, and made her walk in here. All this had happened, and she wasn't even 27. During her first stay, Mary was allowed a certain amount of freedom and was even permitted to hold court in the castle's great hall. However, this came to an end when she became embroiled in a plot to overthrow Elizabeth I. Mary is undoubtedly the biggest threat to Elizabeth, and this is because of her place in the English succession. Henry VIII, of course, had three children. None of them have any heirs. He has no surviving brothers, so his next heirs are his sisters, Margaret, the elder sister, and Mary, the younger. Margaret, the elder sister, marries James IV of Scots, and she has two surviving children. Margaret, the elder sister, is the grandmother of Mary, Queen of Scots, so Mary is effectively her heir. She is the next hereditary heir to the throne. And this really matters to Elizabeth because Elizabeth is still legally illegitimate. So legally she has no title to the throne other than by act of parliament and by her father's will. When Mary Tudor, Mary I, dies, Mary Queen of Scots actually declares herself Queen of England because by the laws of hereditary, she is next heir to the throne. Although she later abandons those claims, Elizabeth, of course, is well aware of Mary's position in succession, and she is incredibly dangerous to Elizabeth's rule. You can see why some of the courts of Europe might have been a bit concerned about the choices that she'd made. And in fact, she historically, you know, we have much record of her saying, uh, my heart is my own. Well, it isn't. She's not a shepherdess running through a field. Her heart and her womb belong to her people, and the decisions she makes should be for the purposes of trade and peace for the nation's sake. And of course, Elizabeth was going to be a master and mistress in her own kingdom, wasn't she? That's a famous quote of hers. And Elizabeth um, had her locked up for nearly 19 years, so she was here four times in total, the last time for 11 months. And then the Babington plot happened and she went from here. And she didn't know that all was known. She didn't know that one of her closest associates was a double agent. And all of these things meant that this is a woman who was constantly confronted by betrayal. In many respects, this is a really sensible policy for Mary, because actually, were Elizabeth to die at any point during Mary's imprisonment, it's really likely that Mary would be declared Queen of England. She knows that there's just one heartbeat between her and the English succession. In 1586, she was implicated in yet another plot to overthrow Elizabeth I, this time known as the Babington Plot. It had been proved without doubt that Mary had consented to murder Elizabeth. Elizabeth knew that Mary wanted her dead. She agrees that Mary should be tried, and of course she's tried for treason. And actually, a treason trial against Mary is, is quite difficult constitutionally because actually she's a foreign ruler. Can she be tried for treason? She, like Mary, a rare example of a reigning queen, and she really doesn't want to set a precedent for executing a fellow queen. And Mary is also one of her closest relatives. Elizabeth doesn't have many relatives. She's agonized previously over killing the Duke of Norfolk, who was a cousin of hers on her mother's side. And it's a similar approach with Mary. She just cannot bring herself to sign a death warrant. Elizabeth reluctantly signed her cousin's death warrant. 
And this was a really difficult move on um, Elizabeth's part. She knew that the execution of anointed queen could set a precedent. So we can perhaps understand Elizabeth's reluctance at making this move. Mary was executed at Fotheringhay Castle and her execution sent shockwaves throughout Europe. Even Elizabeth, well not even, but definitely Elizabeth felt great guilt about this, you know. She didn't want to kill her. She didn't want to kill her. She wanted her dead. That's not at all the same thing. Being prisoner nearly 19 years when you've been exquisitely beautiful and Queen of France and Queen of Scotland. And also she's not illegitimate. How's that? Elizabeth was declared bastard by her own father. And although that was turned round in the same way it was with Mary, still that taint. In 1263, civil war broke out in England. The then Earl of Derby supported Simon de Montfort in the Barons' revolt against Henry III. The rebels were defeated in 1265 and their possessions confiscated. Henry III gave Tutbury Castle to his son Edmund, whom he created Earl of Lancaster in 1267. The castle has remained in the hands of the Earls and Dukes of Lancaster ever since. The castle's peak came under the Lancastrian kings from Henry IV to Henry VI, and most of the surviving structures date from this time. The castle continued to receive some attention in the late 15th century, but despite a visit from Henry VIII in 1511, the castle largely fell into disrepair. The castle played a critical role in the English Civil War of the 17th century. England was plunged into civil war with the Royalist forces led by King Charles I, pitted against the Parliamentarians led by Oliver Cromwell. It was one of the last strongholds of the Royalist forces and was besieged by Parliamentarian troops several times. During the Civil War, the castle was also used as a prison Many high-profile prisoners, including the Duke of Buckingham, were held captive at the castle. The castle's prison cells were cramped and unsanitary, and many prisoners suffered from disease and malnutrition. The conflict culminated in the execution of Charles I and the establishment of a Commonwealth government under Cromwell. During this time, Tutbury Castle was held by both royalist and parliamentary forces and suffered considerable damage as a result. In 1643, the castle was captured by parliamentarians who then destroyed much of the castle and left it in ruins. This destruction caused the castle to fall into disrepair and it was left abandoned for over a century. The restoration of Tutbury Castle began in the 19th century when the castle was rediscovered by antiquarians and historians. The castle was eventually restored to its former glory, and today it is a popular tourist attraction with visitors coming from all over the world to explore its rich history. Nowadays, Tutbury Castle comprises several distinct areas that offer visitors a glimpse into the castle's long and varied history. The oldest part of the castle is the Norman Keep, which dates back to the 11th century. This tower is one of the best preserved in the country and offers stunning views over the surrounding countryside. The castle also features the 14th century Great Hall which was once a center of power and politics in the region. 
visitors can explore the hall's many features, including its impressive fireplace. Other notable areas of the castle include the Tudor lodgings, where Mary, Queen of Scots, was held during her first stay, and the Gregorian gardens, which were added in the 18th century. These gardens offer a peaceful pause from the castle's tumultuous history. Today, Tutbury Castle stands as a testament to the resilience and endurance of this historic site. The castle has undergone many transformations over the centuries, from a fortress to a palace, a prison to a ruin, and finally a popular tourist attraction. Despite the many battles and sieges it has endured, the castle remains remarkably well-preserved. From the imposing Norman keep to the elegant Tudor lodgings, the castle is filled with stories and legends that bring its rich past to life. And while much of the castle lies in ruins, its walls and towers still exude a sense of majesty and grandeur that is impossible to oversee. In the present day, lots of events are being hosted at Tutbury. From weddings to funerals, it can now be rented as a venue for any occasion. The curators also host events of historical reenactment, where some of the castle's history is brought back to life through realistic costumes and performances. As any place with a dark and bloody past, Tutbury is, of course, known to be haunted, with multiple ghost sightings reported throughout the years. Some visitors dare to go on ghost hunts, trying to come across these restless spirits that still remain in the castle. One of the most famous ghosts associated with the castle is the White Lady. The legend states that the ghost is that of a young woman who died of a broken heart after her lover was executed at the castle. The White Lady has been seen by many visitors to the castle, and her haunting presence adds to the castle's mystique and intrigue. Tutbury Castle's pretty famous in the ghost world, people interested in paranormal investigation. And that's because it's got a very long history of ghosts that have been talked about for a, a long, long time. I mean, and ghosts have been part of our culture for a long, long time. I mean, Shakespeare writes about it in Hamlet. Of course, we have fairies that the Tudors viewed as dangerous, in fact, in Midsummer Night's Dream. This idea of uh, places that have had particularly strong events happening, almost like making a record, you know, impregnated within the very walls. And this castle's seen blood and siege and thunder. We've had some terrible periods of time of great brutality and darkness, but also periods of time where people lived and loved and had their babies for hundreds of years, kings and queens visiting, staying. And so that's why this place is, there. oh, it must be something, it's gonna be ghosts. It'll be there. We were able to prove with the dig, uh, with the British Museum and, and Birmingham University, that in fact Romans were here. Uh, we know the Vikings came past. I mean, not just in a few ships with a dragon's head, hundreds of ships on the way through to Repton. So this endless kind of idea of humanity being on this green table on top of a hill. And the reason it's very important is because we've got two Roman roads near here. Now that gives you access to moving your war engines, your goods, people. These, most of us were in a rural community, even in the Tudor period, I mean, yes. And so consequently, a chance to move things around and trade. That's why rivers are equally as important. 
and we have both here. So it's a very important central spot. And about four miles down the road is a place where it's the furthest from anywhere else in England from the sea. So we're pretty far away as well. The idea of people going ghost hunting as an interest in life has had a revival, there's no question about it, of late. But we must remember with the founding of the spiritualist movement towards the end of the 19th century in two massive wars, between the wars particularly, there was a great deal of interest in, these, in seances and table tipping and this sort of thing. Well, there have been plenty of it, of course, in the Victorian period too and uh, we talk about being mesmerised, this was the start of real interest, a mesmer was a real man living uh, on the, um, in Switzerland and he lived and earned his money on considering how hypnosis might help people think differently or be part of healing. So that in its turn also plugging in, if you like, to our spirituality and this castle plugs into a lot of people's spirituality. Another ghostly legend associated with Tutbury Castle is that of a spectral coach that appears on the castle grounds. The coach is said to be driven by the ghost of Mary, Queen of Scots, who is seeking revenge for her captivity and mistreatment at the castle. Now the ghostly side of her is very interesting here because people who serve in the British Army or in the armed forces are the ones who are most likely to claim they've seen her or don't know what they're seeing. And we had a mass sighting about 20 years ago when we had a very large group of army uh, come here who'd been in the army and then they'd formed a historical army group. I'm quite you'd think they'd be had enough of it really but and and they told me how uh, marvelous it was when I'd appeared in the middle of the night in the white gown on top of the North Tower and frightened the hell out of them and how they'd all enjoyed it and uh, I wasn't here and I haven't got a white gown and the tower was locked up and that and interestingly like you can sometimes get people get quite nasty and go oh, come on joke over we know it was you. I said, it most certainly wasn't me, I was in bed. And that's interesting. We've had a Marine who saw Mary crossing at speed across the gardens in, in good sunshine, actually, in an afternoon. And the ghosts here are not necessarily come when it's wet and windy. We get quite a lot of them uh, in the daylight as well on sunny days. And people just think there's a bloke in armour walking about. They think it's a real actor. We've had that twice. And they're not even thinking it's a ghost, and I tend to not disabuse them of that just in case they don't come back. Um, some people get married with us at midnight instead of having reception, they have a ghost hunt. <laughs> the interest is phenomenal really, but the castle has got some very interesting stories associated with it. The most predominant sighting or feeling that people have here, and very often nothing to do with a ghost hunt, you know, just in an afternoon, was after the staircase in this room of the Great Hall was found, which was in January 2000, on the 27th of January. I'd had an airing cupboard removed uh, in the lower floor and the back wall caved in and over the stairs. I mean, it was remarkable. And they're not very old, they're about 1770s, but compared with the wall behind me and the stairs that feed from this room, where one of the walls is about 1360, and, and yeah, that's what we consider pretty old here. So we don't know why they were filled in, we don't know anything about it, all I can say is that they were. We opened them up. Uh, by the way, there was no echo now. Some people listening to this will say, why couldn't you hear an echo? But there was a double layer of wood on the floor and it was very tightly sealed, as was the airing cupboard. So consequently, you couldn't tell. And at the back, you couldn't, it was just a wall. So it opened up and then we started. And certainly, I had a very long coat pulled out one day from me out here. And when I was on my own here, um, but I was quite near where you're sitting, uh, or rather, you at home can see me, it's directly opposite me is, is where this happened. And my coat was pulled out, and I thought, oh, I've caught it on a nail with a cotton. You apply logic straight away, you think that's what's happening, and walked across the room, and then my coat went out again elsewhere. But I mean, not a bit, I mean, it went out. So I thought, well, I must be off. And I went and got my handbag, and I set off downstairs. And I remember vividly, it's very interesting, saying, don't let them see you're frightened. We're taught not to be a victim to the living when we walk. 
particularly women are taught. So I'm going down the stairs with Mian Mang and I could hear the stairs moving behind me. And when I got to the front door, horror upon horror, I had locked myself in. So I then had to scramble in my handbag, which is the bag of Narnia, but eventually I found the keys, got out, locked up and just laughed. And I thought, I'm exhausted. I'm just exhausted. Like, or if you get flu, you know, your bed cover can look like it's moving. I thought that's what's happened. I mean, I'm just, because I was doing 60 to 80 hours a week commonly, and I was completely alone, however. So as I drove off, um, there's a thick mist gathering here at the castle. Now we get that naturally sometimes because we have the River Dove just below, 150 foot up, and in certain weather conditions, the mist can blow up and lay. It's wonderful, you kick it about. Um, so I still think that a very large number of the things that happen here are natural through the weather or shift in the building. One day we had things flying off the uh, gift shop in the day and I got people to go and stand outside because I didn't know what was happening. And actually it was an earthquake, believe it or not, that struck one side of the building um, and it had affected it substantially. But then we started with a child, a little girl in the bedroom, people going in there and saying, I'm sure there's a ghost of a little girl in there. And what was interesting, this is way before the internet. As soon as you've got the internet, you've had it, haven't you? Because people are writing stuff and other people are experiencing it, they want to experience it. But the same name, interestingly, kept coming up, Ellie, Eleanor, Ellie. And that must have come up, seriously, about nine times out of 10. And people saw this figure darting across the room, or they were aware of a kind of Pulse of light moving. Uh, blue lights, I've seen those too. I've seen blue lights too. I fetched this for university people who had a look at it and they said it's very high static, but it comes now and again all the time, which in itself is interesting. I'm interested in the blue lights. For those of you of the Christian faith will know that blue lights appeared above the apostles in the upper room, the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in voices and tongues. And this blue light seen in here. Occasionally we have a red light appear and it looks like the end of a cigarette and when that appears, we go. There's something very unpleasant linked with that. We don't know what it is, but we go. And I certainly sent staff home before now when the atmosphere has become so gripping. Uh, you think, well, is it mass hysteria? People just being silly? No. And then one night when I was sitting in the office in the early days, women running a place like this would not be what you call common. I was in the office and suddenly I screamed out because something had gripped me here, not on the breast, just above it, just gripped me really hard and I brushed it away and when just my secretary was with me, when I looked inside my blouse there were fingerprints uh, or mark, red lines and she saw it and I said, have I imagined that? But subsequently you do think, well is it a muscle spasm or... You know, I've had, is it my own hand that caused the So you fight it, and I think it's appropriate to fight it. Other people work here. Brand new staff, brand new people get a growling sound. That's, I don't tell them, I'm sure they'll know now. Um, and I don't tell them because I want them to have their own experiences and then we can explain what's going on. Because sometimes with people, if you tell them, then they get it. Um, I don't mean they're lying necessarily, but you know, imagination's a terrific thing. And you get, <laughs> What was that? I'll speak in this room, particularly as Mary Queen of Scots in full costume, the lights will pulse. But only on one side of the room sometimes. But they're on the same connection. It's not a separate, it's not a separate system. And all of this constant arrangement of uh, it, it's almost like there are certain times of the year when it's very, very much more active. It's like when the big battles are. You see, in August, we get terribly busy. Just before Christmas, we get terribly busy. When I say busy, I mean ghosts. But this little girl, has a tremendous number of people have experienced her. And then I get people to put the hand out. Now, I do get people to turn the lights out in there, not to frighten them, but because when you are in the dark, your other senses become very much more active. So it enables smell or touch or awareness of somebody near because the body's on alert, if you like. And I would like to say at this point, no, we don't set things up here. If we did, what's the point? 
So we've had, we've had dowsers here, and we had a lot that were linked with Derby University just before we did the massive dig, and they claimed that there is remains in an S shape of a child or a small person in the wall without knowing the story about Ellie. So this figure darting about is seen. When I've been made Queen Scots as well, it's like something's come and looked at me. You get that sensation because the dress is extremely accurate, the gown that I wear. And there is some footage of me talking as Mary and you see a white light seem to come out of me and around, dancing around, and then goes into the back of the fireplace beside me. Well, the reason that's interesting is because we, after that was filmed, looked in the back of the fireplace because quite clearly it's too shallow, forgot completely about this footage of this white light and sure enough, where it went in, there's a space at the back, it's almost telling us. And it's lined with cream stones, about that big, and we didn't know it was there. One thing is clear about Tutbury Castle. This is a place that has seen it all. From the Vikings to the Normans, from kings and queens to soldiers and rebels, from bloodshed and torture, to betrayal and imprisonment. The walls of Tutbury Castle have witnessed some of the most dramatic and tumultuous events in English history. And yet, despite all of the violence and tragedy that has taken place within its walls, Tutbury Castle remains a place of beauty and wonder. Its ruins stand as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and to the enduring power of captivating history. Today, visitors to Tutbury Castle can wander its winding passages and explore its ancient chambers, marveling at the architecture and imagining the lives of those who once lived and died here. Dare to stand in the footsteps of the great monarchs and rebels and feel the weight of history on your shoulders. Remember the bloody stories that these walls hold.